Welcome to The Other Web. Our guest today is Michael Kasumovich. Michael is an Associate Professor of Evolutionary Biology at UNSW Sydney. His research explores the intersection of humanity and technology with the goal of understanding how technology affects humans and the way humans behave and perceive themselves. Michael, welcome to the show. Ah, thanks for having me, Alex. It's a pleasure. It's great to have you on. So your research is focused on the intersection of humanity and technology. Why? Oh, man, <laughs> why not? It's just so awesome, <laughs> isn't it? Like we've been humans for so long, and all of a sudden, these last few you know decades, you know, technology has just changed absolutely everything about us. It's just shifted how we behave, how we interact, what we look for in partners, what we look for in friends. It's just a great way to explore what it means to be human and, you know, how technology is kind of changing what it means to be human. So is a human now physically different, maybe even genetically different than a human before technology? You know, the evolution doesn't really quite happen that quickly, um, but we're starting to see shifts in, in behavior. You know, I, I guess the most common thing parents would probably see is attention span changes, right? Um, so we're seeing stuff like that happen and we're seeing changes in how we perceive ourselves and how we perceive friends and how important things are to us. But, you know, genetically, no, we're not changing. We're not shifting that quickly. I guess unless we define technology as things like fire, in which case our digestive tract has probably changed quite a bit because of it, right? That's exactly it. Fire has changed humanity so much. It's just made it so much more delicious as well, which is thankfully. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it, it was an invention, you know, tens of thousands of years ago. And, you know, it's, it's changed humanity. Probably not as much as AI is going to do so, but, you know, uh, it's interesting to explore. Yeah, so we'll definitely get to AI because this is what I do for a living. But first, <laughs> you mentioned how we perceive ourselves. How is that changing? Yeah, so, you know, if you imagine us living in, in small cities or small towns or rural villages, we'd end up knowing everyone around us. And as a consequence, you know, we get a good feeling about ourselves. We'd know where we'd sit in society. We'd know our place in the village kind of thing. Everyone had their role. Now, imagine... You know, you're moving countries now. We've connected the whole world together with boats and trains and planes. Now everyone can be everywhere or anywhere they want to be. Take it to the next level. If we look at social media, it allows us to see what everyone anywhere is doing at any time. And sometimes those stories we see on social media make us feel kind of bad about ourselves and our lives because they look so wonderful and so great. Boy, why can't I have a wonderful life like that? So... Just seeing images like that all the time kind of ends up changing our, our perspective of who we are, what we are, and, and how well we're doing in society. And that changes how we behave. Does it only work one way? You basically see something amazing on Instagram and you feel inferior? Or is there the opposite effect as well that now you actually get to see slums in India and you're thinking, well, my life is actually pretty good. I was born with a faucet in the house. Exactly. I know. And that's the way I always think about it. But it depends. It depends on the individual, right? It depends on how they view themselves and their own status. And I think that has a lot to do with how we perceive others and, and, and how we end up, you know, feeling about ourselves. I am very much like what you just said. I look at some parts of the world and go, wow, I'm a lucky guy. But there's a lot of other people who go, wow, there's a lot of rich people. I wish I had that. It just depends on your perspective. Is there a way to actually make the latter perspective somewhat more common? I wish, yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> that, wouldn't that be amazing? Everybody would be so much happier. Yeah, and it certainly seems to be a problem, especially with teenagers and Instagram. Like, There's quite a bit of research basically showing that exactly. it is quite deleterious, especially for young girls. Yeah, it, absolutely. It can be. And I think that research is really interesting and really important. But I think we still have to start drilling down and understanding who is more susceptible to that? Because obviously not everyone is being affected the same way. And some people find social media a really rewarding kind of experience where they can find friends and colleagues that they normally wouldn't have found. So there's positives and negatives with that. But it's, I think it's interesting to explore, or we need to explore, who is most affected positively and negatively. And like you suggested, understanding how. And maybe we can shift people in a positive way. Right. So... Perception is one level. 
after that behavior happens. So how is technology affecting our behavior? Yeah, it's, it's so strongly linked to perception. If I can give you an example from some of my research, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah. So uh, what's really neat about video games is they allow you to see how you perform. And when you play a multiplayer video game, they allow you to see how good you are relative to other people. And I think that's a really fascinating way to kind of manipulate somebody's perception because in an experimental sense, you can manipulate whether they win or lose. And then you can ask them certain things and you can see how they behave. For example, we had this one study where we told students that they were when coming in that they're going to end up competing against another rival, another same-sex individual. And that's going to be physical competition where they're going to be having to play in a tug of war, for example, or they're going to have to try and lift as much weight as they can. And individuals coming in were told that, and then they were told that that opponent is going to be either stronger or weaker than them. Then when they were preparing themselves and just before they were ready to do the competition, we said, hey, We're just going to talk to these other folks and give them the same spiel as we told you and get them prepared. While you're waiting, would you like to play one of these video games that we have listed here? And we gave them a choice of six games, three of them being violent, aggressive games and competitive games, and three of them being non-competitive games. And those people who were weaker ended up choosing the more competitive and aggressive games. And we argued that was because they were trying to pump themselves up and prepare themselves for this competition so they were trying to get ready and get more aggressive so they can perform better. Interesting. So I've had a question about games for a very long time that I think I know the answer to, but maybe you can help me understand better. Sure. If the game is violent, does Mm -hmm. it serve as kind of an outlet for an existing urge, almost like letting the steam out? Or does it actually desensitize the player to violence and makes them more likely to act out their fantasies in real life? Yeah, so that's been talked about quite a lot, and it's such an interesting question. We do know that violent video games don't make people violent. They can some individuals, but those individuals likely have some other kind of mental health issues underlying that behavior. But if we look at the number of people who play video games around the world... If video games made people violent, my goodness, our society would be so aggressive and so violent because virtually everyone's playing these kinds of games. But that's not what we see. And what we do see is some really strong evidence that demonstrates that kids can tell the difference between what's real and what's not real. So when they're playing, for example, Grand Theft Auto V and they're running around and pulling people out of cars and crashing and shooting cops, they know that's play and make believe. And it does feel like it's a way to let off steam and just kind of relax. But our research really does show that it it does one more thing. It really allows you to understand where you sit in the hierarchy. So after playing with different players of different skill levels for a really long time, you kind of get an understanding of how good you are. And that lets you kind of figure out your place in society a little bit better. Some people, it takes longer for them to do that. And we argue that those people will end up playing more violent video games until they figure it out. And there's a potential interesting loop there that could lead to addiction, but that's something that we still need to explore. Interesting. So you think that people who play video games a lot are, in a sense, trying to determine their status? Exactly. Interesting. I never thought of it that way. But let me ask you then, if we switch out of violence, it seems like we use technology to substitute a lot of our urges. Porn is probably the best example. Absolutely. And at least with porn, it does seem like the countries where you have more porn usage, less people report being interested in actual physical sexual partners, right? So it does serve as a bit of a substitute. But on the other hand, people who use porn tend to have more urge to use porn. And so in some cases, it's self-reinforcing and addicting. And in some cases, it's a substitute. Do both of these effects always coexist? Yeah. You know, probably is my guess, simply because humans are just so variable. And there's so many different factors that lead to our behaviors. So I would guess that, you know, individuals would fall into one of those groups and probably quite a bit of a spectrum 
as well, just because we vary so much in, in a lot of our different behaviors. So I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Yeah. I, I even had this discussion outside of the technology realm about whether crying leads to more crying or less crying over time, right? Or whether venting, let's say your anger, right. leads to being angrier over time or less angry over time. And I have no idea which one it is. It seems to be entirely situational. Yeah, it, it, it probably is. And, and probably depends on the individual as well. But, uh, you know, a good colleague of mine will say ruminating about anger, you know, that does end up making you more angry. So if something bad happens to you, just don't ruminate about it and it'll slowly disappear and it'll, it'll be like it never happened. But those that ruminate and it ends up sticking in and probably does have that self-reinforcing kind of nature to it. But there's also the people who actually truly believe that they have to vent it right away. Otherwise it will right. fester. Yes. Right? And, and I always look at this and I think, yeah, but if you're in the habit of immediately acting out every emotion, chances are you'll get more of this over time, not less. Could be. And it'd be an interesting study. I think it'd be hard to find all the people to uh, to take part as participants in this study because I think it have to be pretty long term as well. But it's an interesting question. All right. So I want to talk to you in general. What other human needs or human urges does technology seem to be trying to substitute and how is it affecting us? You know, I think the the one that's probably most in the media now is friendship, right? Partners. Um, we see lots of people going to AI chatbots for friendship, or especially the individuals who find it difficult to find friends. And I think that's a wonderful aspect of the technology because the possibilities are endless in the sense that we could help individuals who have you know, increased anxiety, for example. But at the same time, we have to be really, really careful about it because we don't want those digital interactions to kind of replace real interactions between individuals, because there's a fundamental difference between how AI chatbots talk to talk to a human and how other humans talk to a human. And then we can really quickly lose those skills of talking to each other. Hasn't this transition already happened 15 years ago or so when human avatars, essentially talking on social media, replaced interactions with other humans? Like those are pretty different from humans in real life as well, right? Absolutely, absolutely. But I think it's just the scale that it's happening now and the ease at which you can have a really smooth conversation where it, it feels like a really human kind of conversation. I think that's the, that's the difference. But you're absolutely right. It has happened for a while. Yeah. Also, I'm trying to remember in what year, but I remember being in Japan when the Aibu was introduced. It's this little dog that was yes. basically a, a robotic pet. Yes, I remember And Aibu means friends, right? A friend, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's, no, that's, I totally forgot about that little dog. Yeah, that was a while ago. <laughs> yeah, more than 10 years, I think. Uh, absolutely. It feels like a lifetime ago compared to all the technology coming out now. So where do you think this is all going? Because if you look at surveys, at least in the US, it already seems like the most common answer to how many good friends do you have is zero. So how, <sighs> how can terrifying. it get farther than that? Yeah, oh, that's such a scary number. I haven't heard that before. And uh, that's been surveyed out in the US, has it? Yeah, granted that's the mode. That's not the majority or the plurality, right? But still. That's, that's almost terrifying to me to hear that. I, I didn't know about that number at all. Wow. It's, um, it does make me a little bit sad because I can see people getting things of value from AI. And I don't see anything wrong with that. But I guess my issue is where individuals can't have a proper conversation where they're challenged. Because an AI right now won't really challenge your ideas. It won't, it can console you. It can tell you all these wonderful things, but it won't challenge you. It won't push you as a human and it won't criticize you, which is, I think is a really important part of being a human because that's how we shape our own view of the world. And therefore, our own behavior. If that's kind of missing, that makes me a little bit sad for humanity. Do you think there would be value of, to train that? Because it's not hard. I mean, the reason current AI systems don't do that is because basically they went through reinforcement learning through human feedback. Exactly. So what they learned was not to give the best answer. It was to give the answer that makes the listener happiest. Yeah. It's kind of the way that the average American speaks anyway. Yeah. So <laughs> I have no comment on that. 
<laughs> Sorry, I'm an Israeli living in the US. So for Israelis, <laughs> everybody else is being coy and not speaking their mind, right? Yes, fair enough. That's fair. <laughs> um, but yeah, would there be value in training AI models that are somewhat more opinionated, argumentative, direct? Well, I guess that's when we start getting to the idea of, of proper gen AI, I guess, uh, where it acts more human-like. I think there would be value. I guess the question would be, would society see value in that? And would people want to pay for that? I mean, I'm certainly, when I'm hiring employees, mm -hmm. to me, this is a huge plus, right? I want somebody opinionated. I want somebody to challenge me. In fact, I would sometimes in the interview process, I would say something questionable just to see the reaction. Yep. If they immediately nod and start smiling and repeating to me what I just said, then I'm not going to get an original thought out of that person. Yes. Right? That's the exact same way that I hire individuals as well. And I think now you've let the cat out of the bag. So now everyone's going to be challenging you a lot more possibly. <laughs> it's all right. I can handle it. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm kind of curious. With AI, it seems like for the first time we're getting technology that is actually able to perform human tasks instead of just fractions of things that humans define yes. well. How is that going to change our behavior? We essentially have an, an endless number of human-like helpers now, maybe still electronic and not physical, but still. Yeah, I, I think that's a really interesting question. And you know, I don't think the literature has looked at it far enough because it's just it seems so far away, but it does seem to be coming closer much more quickly than we anticipated. I can only imagine it's going to change our behavior. It, you know, if we all had our own, you know, a dozen butlers and maids for us, you know, that changes how you behave on a daily basis and the things that you do. You know, in a perfect world, I guess we'd have more time to do all the things that we want to do, but I'm not 100% sure that reality is going to come to fruition, really. Yeah, and I'm a bit of a cynic in the sense that I think Me too. most bad behavior in the world is a result of free time. And so <laughs> if you increase the amount of free time that people have, you're not going to get more creativity. You're going to get more bad behavior. Oh, man, you're probably right. And, and that kind of saddens me a little bit as well, to be honest. Yeah, I would even say that most depression in the Western world is a result of too much free time. Yes. Because it seems to be absent in societies where people just don't have time to ruminate, like you said. That's exactly it, because you're more worried about where you're going to eat you know, what food you're going to have, where you're going to make that little money that you can. So you're, you're hustling as much as you can. And that takes up all your time. I totally agree that that has a, has a completely changed Western society. Right. Crazy thought. If the effect of AI is basically the equivalent of having a dozen butlers. Yep. Can we just look at the way rich people lived in the past and assume that... That's how we'll be. That, though, yeah, those are the traits that we're about to develop. It's definitely possible. And if that's the case again, oh man, we really need to do better, don't we? <laughs> because well, I mean, that's I one way of looking at it. <laughs> the other one is you, you, you can now become Aristotle, right? Because yes. all, Aristotle obviously never did his own laundry. So, no, probably not. <laughs> yeah. And just had all the free time to think. You know, to me, I think that that is would be an awesome opportunity. We'd have more free time to just think. Think positively about problems and things. But like you said, I don't think most people would use that time in that kind of a way. You know, hopefully we wouldn't get more trolls on the internet, but that seems pretty likely, wouldn't it? <laughs> Doesn't it? We would definitely get more AI trolls. Yes. Um, and I should mention what I'm working on in my day job is basically making AI that curates content to eliminate mostly human generated junk but eventually ai generated junk as well so right. hopefully we can have ai that filters ai trolls as well that would be wonderful i'm sure you probably saw that uh, the news the social ai that came out a little while ago uh, essentially like twitter but it's just bots you just interact with bots and you can select the type of bots that you want to interact with you and they can be supportive or they can be antagonistic and that's a weird experience. Yeah. Emulating connection seems like an odd thing to have. I totally agree. I can't imagine why this was done, but you know, everyone has their, their vision, which all the power to them. Since you are researching this and you're basically looking at how this changes humans, 
Mm. Where is this going? How would it change us? Yeah, you know, what happens if you have a bot that's a complete sycophant and always agrees with everything you say and do and always supports you? I can't imagine that leading to a good thing. It leads to you becoming a dictator over time. Like basically everybody will become their own Putin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And no one wants to interact with anybody because no one wants to ever, you know, allow you to cross that line. And everyone's always aggressive. So, yeah, I don't, I, I don't think that that's going to end well if, if, it, if we have bots and AI that ends up just constantly supporting us. We need that challenge. We need more of a human kind of interaction. I know you've also researched mating a bit, obviously, as mm -hmm. part of that evolutionary research. How does technology affect that, especially in a world where people are becoming, A, less competent at yep. generating human connections, and B, probably less pleasant to be around to begin with? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I find that, that change really, really fascinating because I think it has the potential to explain you know, just rela how relationships are working out and why people are struggling with online dating, for example. But um, I have a, we have some preliminary results from a little study that we run and we have to, we have to get a larger sample size. But uh, along the same lines of that competition study that we had, we ha also had a, a mate competition study where we brought somebody into a room and we said, oh, you're going to meet somebody uh, over a video conference call, and we're just studying how individuals kind of interact in this online dating world and what partners are looking for uh, in another partner or individuals are looking for in a partner. And we had a video play in front of them, which obviously was an actor, and they pretended to have a conversation with them. And the person would listen to when our participant actually talked. and would talk about what they're looking for in a partner. And the individuals that we had, both the male and female actors, were both attractive individuals and were had a script that made them look like really wonderful potential partners. And all of our participants would have liked to have gone on a coffee date with them. So they would have this interview and then we'd say, okay, they're going to interview somebody else and they're going to choose between one of you. And after that was completed, obviously that person... There was no com actual competition, and we just gave them an envelope that had a random outcome in there, which was you did get a coffee date or you did not get a coffee date. And what we ended up finding is when somebody did got a coffee date, they were obviously very happy. And when they didn't, they were disappointed. And then once again, we asked them, which games would you like to play? Because we're running a new study next month, and we'd like to see which games people like. And those individuals who lost the coffee date were more likely to want to play a violent, aggressive, competitive game compared to individuals who won the coffee date. Yeah, this is what, what I have a boxing bag for in my house. Yes, <laughs> yes exactly. So we, you know, we all have to take out our aggression or our loss in some kind of way. And it seems that video games are a really good way to do that. I want to ask you about something you said earlier, that you think people are struggling with online dating. Are yes. they? It seems like online dating has basically taken over because it's a more efficient way to meet people, no? Yeah, but it seems over the last year, people are, are leaving it in droves. If we see a lot of, there's a lot of articles that are talking about individuals leaving things like Tinder and Hinge just because the relationships are extremely superficial. Men are looking for something completely different to women and nobody is really investing in that relationship. Is that because of what Tinder did to the space? And maybe what was there before, like OkCupid, okay, I guess before that you had plenty of fish. Like yes. Maybe those things were better because you actually had to read about a person before selecting them? And, you know, I, I, once again, it's, I, I think you're right. You know, at the end of the day, Tinder has made it so easy to swipe between potential mates that you're going through so many individuals in a short period of time. And then once again, you get to see the possibilities of how many individuals you could go on a date with. So men end up becoming less picky and women become more picky. And then it just doesn't end up working out in the long run. So I've always thought that when at least half the world, not the entire world, but at least half the world moved from walking up to people in a bar yeah. To actually reading a person's profile before writing them a message, 
that was kind of an upgrade because in the bar you could only go by looks. Yes. And here you had looks on OkCupid. You had answers to various questions and things like that. You had match percentages, right? That that was an upgrade. Yes. But then it seems like when it transitioned to Tinder, then it regressed and it regressed farther than the bar because now not only do you only go by looks, yes, <laughs> but instead of seeing one attractive person, you can swipe through a thousand. That's exactly it, right? So it's changed the whole perspective and the whole dating game. And I agree. I don't think it was for the better. And people are starting to vote with their wallets now. And it seems like those companies are in a little bit of trouble. So lucky for me, I stopped dating before Tinder became a thing. So uh, <laughs> you and me both, man. I don't think I would enjoy this world right now in that regard. It's too hard. Um, what is the solution then if this doesn't work? And I don't think people are going back to walking up to somebody at a bar. What's mating going to look like in a couple of years? Uh, that's a good question. And it really depends on, on what society chooses. It's so hard to predict. But I agree that without the social skills, people won't be able to just walk up to somebody or that's going to seem really, really difficult and impossible. But what we do end up seeing now in response is people are joining gyms, for example, or joining different hobbies uh, to try and meet people with the similar kinds of interests as them. So they're actually seem like they're playing a bit more of a long game in an attempt to find people who have the similar interests and then potentially finding a partner within that, within that group. So let me ask you then about a much older technology that, at least in my observation, seemed to have affected this quite a bit. Yes. The airplane. Um, yes. It, is it just me or is it just much harder to do all of this when most of the people around you aren't from the same town as you? And you can no longer just be in a place where you automatically have 90% of your experience in common with every person you meet. And that's always fascinated me as well. You know, the airplane, I think, has changed everything. You know, how we live, where we choose to live, how we choose to spend our free time, the individuals that we end up interacting with. I think, yeah, it's an excellent example of how that's reframed what we look for in a partner and what we expect in a partner. And I think this technology now is doing a very similar kind of thing. Going even beyond that, even after you find the partner, it reframed what life looks like afterwards, because most of the time where you and your partner end up living is not the place where you have grandparents and aunts and exactly. people who can help babysit. And so the entire house economy essentially has changed. Absolutely. It sounds like you've gone through this. I definitely have when we, when we moved from Canada to Australia. And it's, it's, it's huge. It's such an enormous change because you don't have that support system that we're used to having as humans. Yeah, we're, we're constantly having this, um, I guess, import cycle of let's import my wife's mom for yes. three weeks and then my parents <laughs> for three weeks. And we're trying to alternate and manage this because obviously it's very helpful to us. It's very good to them to spend time with the grandkids. Exactly. But it requires quite a bit of planning and effort that I'm sure our ancestors didn't have to. That's exactly it. We're spending a lot of time doing things our ancestors never had to. And that takes a lot of brain space. Absolutely. All right. Last question. Open-ended. What is the brightest future that you see? How is technology going to make us better in the best case scenario? In the best case scenario. Wow. I'm, you're, you're really letting me be wishful here, it seems. Oh, yes. Um, in so many ways, wouldn't it be wonderful if, if AI actually does what people like Sam Altman say it's going to do? I think that would be fantastic. If we would... 80% of the jobs would be taken up by AI and we have a universal basic income and we're all kind of supported and comfortable and AI is able to allow us to be more creative. I think that's a fascinating thing. It'll allow us to explore and understand the world in such a better way. It would allow us to interact with each other and understand humans in a better way. We could have, you know, a very utopia kind of society. I don't see that happening at all, unfortunately, because if we see how AI is used, the first thing it's used for is to send you, you know, phishing emails 
for example, or, or phone calls in an attempt to kind of take money, the little money elderly people have away from them. So whenever there's an opportunity to use AI to benefit oneself, I, th- I think it's going to happen. And at the end of the day, we are all selfish. All organisms are. It's not just humans. Any organism is a selfish organism and looking for its own best interest. But it's unfortunate that as a society, we humans can't look beyond that and, and look to each other and, and help each other with AI. That would be a wonderful thing, but yeah. So I know it's a question people usually ask me, or at least some variation of it, but I'm going to ask you. Yeah. Is AI itself going to become selfish? Yeah, well, if I guess technically, if we if we get real gen AI, yeah, probably because it has to be to be able to benefit itself, just like humans. In which case, it will be self replicating like any other organism. That's exactly it, and I guess that's the fear that some people hold that that's actually going to end up happening. Um, and I guess it's possible, right? There's a, there's so many books and movies and video games that have explored that concept, I think, really, really well. One of my favorites, actually, most recently, is a Netflix anime called Pluto, which I think is absolutely fantastic and explores the concept of AI in a really human kind of way. Um, yeah, so that, that'll, that always makes me think that there are positives to come out of this, but, you know, humanity always pulls it back to reality. <laughs> well, here's the hoping that between all the possible realities and the possible futures, we end up at least somewhat closer to the positive and benign one. Yes, I look forward to that timeline you speak of. <laughs> all right, Michael, thank you so much for joining. It's been a pleasure. My absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, Alex.